Well, hello to you. Welcome indeed to The Reality Show. So good to be with you. The Reality Show is a half-hour talk show where we talk to people from all walks of life who've discovered the reality of walking with Jesus. Changed lives, changed lives. As we listen to these lives touched and changed by the reality of Jesus, we know that the Lord himself will touch and change our lives for the good, for good. But well, today on The Reality Show, we're going to be speaking to Tom Ingalls. Tom Ingalls is a worship leader. He's a pastor. He's an author and uh, he's quite an incredible man serving the Lord Jesus in his work and ministry. Tom founded a ministry called Psalmody International, which runs a course called the Psalmody Course, which is all about living out our lifestyle of worship, a daily walk of thanksgiving before God. Tom also comments on the longevity and health benefits of living a lifestyle like this. So we're going to be talking to Tom today on The Reality Show. Tom, thank you so much for joining us. The Lord is seeking worshippers, not just an act of worship. And we're going to be talking about the psalmody uh, course in just a minute. But let's begin at the beginning. Tom Ingalls, man of God, how did you find Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Well, first of all, it's lovely to speak to you, Dudley, uh, and to your audience. Thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I found the Lord uh, actually um, through my sister-in-law and brother-in-law. They had been... Uh, saved a few years before we were, my wife and I. And uh, I had been involved in secular music. And uh, when I got married to Barbara, she asked me to give it up. Um, and uh, she wasn't used to the clubs or anything like that. So I said, okay, I would do that. And so I gave up the music and uh, I was in, in a sense desperate to uh, to sing, you know, I'd always sung my whole life. And so, um, for about two years, we used to go to my brother-in-law and sister-in-law and um, uh, Sunday afternoons, and uh, they would make us lunch. And then Sunday afternoon would come and they would say, every week, would you like to come to church? And we would say, no, we're not interested. Mm. You know, I said, I'm Presbyterian, she's Anglican, and uh, we're not interested in Jesus, you know. <laughs> and so th this went on for quite a while. And oh. then um, he said to me one, one Sunday afternoon, he says, Tom, there's music in the church. And, and I says, music, uh, what kind of music? And he says, well, we've got one of the best um, rock singers in the country, uh, knows the Lord and uh, has met the Lord, and we've got one of the best jazz pianists in the country playing tonight as well. So would you like to come along? So I was intrigued by this, and I thought, well, you know, this will be interesting. I had no idea, no concept at all mm -hmm. of uh, music in church. So... We went along and I said to him, you know, we'll go, but as soon as the music's finished, we'll we'll leave if that's okay. Mm -hmm. They said, yeah, that's fine. So we went along. It was a tiny little church in Johannesburg, one of the suburbs there. And um, there was probably about 20 people in the church. And uh, and so these, there was three musicians playing that night and they were exceptional, just exceptional. But um, what happened during the worship I, I felt, um, I, I can only call it a conviction. I didn't know what it was at the time. Um, I couldn't explain it, but I felt during the worship that I had to make right with God. It was a strange experience. Hmm. Um, this was during the worship time. And then the pastor got up and he um, he gave a message. And then he, uh, he, uh, he gave a, an altar call and he said, if anybody would like to know Jesus, you know, would you put your hand up? Well, I put my hand up. And I looked at Barbara, and she had already her hand up. And so, um, so the pastor says, "Oh, would you would you come to the front?" So we went to the front, and <laughs> a bit reluctantly, and he led us through, um, you know, the prayer, and we got born again. And uh, and that night, I remember I went home, and and I thought, "This is crazy," you know. I think I've just, you know, put my hand up to a cult. I thought it was some kind of cult. But I knew that something had happened. I knew there was something genuine had taken place. And so I, um, during the week, I I, uh, I was working away in my, in my laboratory. I, I was a chemist, an industrial chemist. And I got this phone call. And it was from the pastor. And he said, uh, you know, I'd, I'd like you to consider joining the band. And, and I said, the band? And he said, yeah. He said, uh, you know, I'm putting together this band and uh, we would like you to consider joining it. So it was like a, an open door for me. I, I said, yes, you know, although I didn't really want to go back to the church. But I, I said, yes, because there were great musicians. And uh, it so turned out that we, we started this little band and um, in the Assemblies of God. And 
something happened from the very beginning when we started the band. Um, we just uh, we just saw people getting touched. Um, some people would get healed. Um, some people would uh, would respond to salvation. And uh, you know, within a, a couple of years of that, we quickly became known as the Assemblies of God Band in South Africa. And so we would travel all over the place. And the same thing happened. We we just continually saw um, people getting touched. And we had no reference for this. I had no reference at all. I didn't even know these things were supposed to happen through worship ministry, but they were. And then um, uh, a person called Ray McCauley, a very uh, famous preacher, um, had come back from America and uh, he uh, he had met the rock singer who was in our band downtown Johannesburg just by coincidence or God incidence. And uh, he says, what are you doing? And, and Dave said to him, he says, well, I've, I've, uh, I'm in this band called the Rama Band. And uh, he says, why? He says, I've just come back to start a church. He says, I haven't even started it yet, but it's going to be called the Rama Church. So Dave come back and told us, he says, there's this guy South African guy's been in America studying and he's going to start a church called the Rhema Church. And and we thought it was bizarre. We, we, you know, we, I said to him, I said, I think he stole our name, you know, and he said, no, I mean, there's a whole a lot of things going on in America. There's a big Bible school called Rhema. And and uh, so so what happened was he, Rhema Colley asked if he could come in and meet the band. And he came over to our homes. And for about six weeks, he started teaching us uh, principles of God's word, um, and you know, my wife and I, we just kind of exploded in the inside, mm. um, because we had never heard anything quite like that before. Uh, it really set us free. And before very long, we um, we decided that the Rama Band should join the Rama Church, and we did. And we joined the Rama Church, um, probably when it was a bit two months old. There was probably about sixty people in it at that time. And uh, when we joined, the same thing happened again. Um, Ray's wonderful gift of teaching and prophetic ministry, gifts of the Spirit operating in conjunction with the Rhema Band uh, was a magnet to people. And people just came and we saw remarkable things happen. Mm -hmm. And um, and then he asked me um, to to become the... To, actually, I, I was one of the first members that he took on full time. So I left my, my, my little company. I had a little chemical company, and I, I gave that away. And I, I joined Ray as, uh, as one of his, uh, his, uh, his pastoral staff and I taught wow. in the Bible school. Wow. And then um, became the music director for Rema and saw a phenomenal growth uh, from 60 people to about 15,000. Wow. Um, and just a remarkable move of God. It took place in South Africa. And that, this was um, from the the late 79 till about 85, 87, 88, somewhere there, almost for about 10 years, there was a, a sustainable move of God. I wouldn't say it was revival, but it was a move of God. Mm -hmm. It's phenomenal. <laughs> Praise God. Yeah. All starting out with uh, wanting to make music uh, and how the yeah. Lord used yeah, that exactly. uh, to, to bring you into that, that opportunity. Tom, I want to ask you, um, First of all, uh, you know, you landed up in that situation. You ended up in that church. You heard the gospel. You heard the message. Jesus touched your life. But uh, I don't believe personally that it started there. I believe that people pray for us to enter the kingdom of God. And God answers prayers. Do you believe there was anybody praying for you uh, at that stage before you gave your life to Jesus? There was, in fact, uh, Dudley, yes. Um, when we, uh, when we, uh, we, my mom and dad and myself, when we moved to South Africa, we moved into an apartment. And um, we were, um, there's only two floors and we were on the top floor and, uh, you know, up the steps and into the left was where we lived and then to the right was an elderly couple. Mm -hmm. And um, and he used to wait for me, him and his old wife. He used to wait for me and, and he would uh, he would hear me coming. He would hear the car. I had an old rickety car. And uh, when he heard that car, he... Uh, he would open his screen door. I can still hear the squeaky screen door. <laughs> and he would say, hello, Tom. And I'd say, hi, Mr. Dello. And he would say, Jesus loves you, my boy. And I'd say, yeah, thank you. And I'd go in quickly. And, uh, you know, this went on for ages. He, he always just 
would would listen for me coming. I tried to avoid him at times <laughs> and park in different places and, and just walk. <laughs> But he always seemed to hear me and he always encouraged me. Anyway, um, when I married Barbara, I moved away um, to another suburb. And then it was uh, it was 10 years down the road that I actually got saved. Um, And so I went back to Mr. Della to him and his wife still living in the same house, same apartment. And uh, when I saw him. I said, Mr. Dello, I, I believe I'm just like you. I, I've met Jesus and I'm born again. And he wasn't overly excited. He, he says, oh, that's good, Tom. He says, that's good. And he gave me a hug and uh, that was it. You know, and I was I was kind of disappointed. And he said to me this, he said, Tom, he said, I knew you would get saved. He says, the first day I prayed for you, but it's taken 10 years. He says, my wife and I prayed for you every day for 10 years. Wow. But from the first day that we prayed, we knew that you would get saved. It just took time. Wow. wow. And so it was it was their prayers that led me to know the Lord. I'm convinced of that. Yeah. And then um, five years later than that, um, God um, gave me the opportunity to be full time in the ministry um, with the Rhema Church. And I went back to Mr. Dell, who's still there, way in their 80s. Hmm. And, uh, and I said to him, you know, full-time in ministry and God has called me and he says I know he says we've prayed you in as well so they consistently prayed over a period of maybe 15 years for me 10 years for my salvation and then um, five years for my uh, my full-time ministry role but but I was ministering in Cape Town many years later and uh, a lady came up to me and says Tom she said I've heard your story she said I um, I was intrigued because I, uh, I, I come to find out that Mr. Della also prayed for me. So I started doing some research, spent some time with him, um, contacted some people, and I discovered that he had prayed, him and his wife had prayed into the kingdom, uh, about 200 people. Wow. Um, wow. And he, she said, you know, I don't know if you know the story, but when he was in his late 80s, he went looking for a job. And this was during the apartheid years in South Africa. So here's this, uh, he was a professional businessman. He was uh, an English guy, actually. They they came from the UK. And uh, he found a job making tea, which was such an unusual thing for, you know, for a white man to actually be working as a tea man Mm. um, in an office in Johannesburg. And so when I heard this, I contacted him and I said, you know, why would you do that? He says, well, he says, my assignment is not over yet. He says, um, every day I go go by train into Johannesburg and uh, I just make the tea for the people in the office. I'm thankful for the job. He says, but it's not the money. He says, got nothing to do with money. He says, it's the assignment that God has given me. And the assignment is to save souls. He says, so when I'm in the train, I, uh, I ask God to uh, show me who to speak to wow. and to lead them to Christ. So he was a remarkable man, and, uh, and then she told me that um, his his elderly wife died, and then he told her, this lady, that um, his assignment was over, and he died within three months of his oh. wife. So it's quite a remarkable story, but yeah. I'm, uh, I'm thankful because, to be honest with you, there was no one in the Ingalls family uh, or in my wife's family that were saved. Uh-huh. But through the, by the grace of God, we uh, we led most of them to the Lord. Praise God. So it was a, a cascade effect that started with Mr. and Mrs. Dello. Wow. And, you know, and through my ministry has impacted uh, tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people all over the world. Praise God. I call this prayer evangelism. Every one of us, you know, Jesus has called us all into all the world. We're all called to serve him and to yes. witness for our faith. Uh, and some people... I put my hand up very quickly, (laughs) are nervous to speak to others on a train. Um, And yet God has given us the power of prayer and it's powerful. Um, And and, and I have a little list I call my EPL, my evangelism prayer list, (laughs) putting names on that list and keep praying, keep praying, keep praying. Yes. Yeah, you don't give up. You just don't, don't give, give up. up. I mean, that's it. That's the point. Praise God. Well, God touched and changed your life for the good, Tom Ingalls, and uh, you've gone on to do some amazing work. 
Well, if you've just joined us, you're listening to The Reality Show, watching us today on Revelation Television. It's so good to be with you. I'm Dudley Anderson, today talking to a good friend, Tom Ingalls. Uh, and Tom has just shared with us how he came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior, quite remarkably uh, walking into the church and finding the message of, of the cross through music. Uh, and God knows where to touch our hearts, as Tom uh, is a musician touched his life and changed his life for the good. And we've just discovered how important it is to pray for people, to put them down on a list, dare I say, and pray for their salvation. We can touch the world through our prayers. Tom, thank you so much for joining us today on The Reality Show. Uh, we're gonna be uh, talking about uh, your ministry in just a minute, but uh, you started out by saying um, that you were a musician before you found music in the church. Can I ask you an honest question? <laughs> what is the difference between the music you made before and the music you make after you came to salvation. What's the difference in that kind of music? Well, it's it's huge because um, you know uh, people have people have asked me this is what you know really qualifies uh, a person um, to be a worship or a music minister. The the difference for me was was obviously God. I mean the 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 what you do in the world is for yourself for the people. What you do in the church is for God and also to help the people. But really, you do it unto God. Mm -hmm. And the, the difference is basically this. It's interesting that um, L Lucifer, as we know, was um, the, the cherub who covered the throne of God, and we believe it was with praise, because you can find that in uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. And so he perverted the, the worship. Um, um, but there's an interesting scripture that talks about this. It says he was perfect. He was created perfect in his ways but there's a scripture that says that he was an anointed mm -hmm. so you know so it's not enough to be perfect or to be a good musician within the church there's actually got to be an anointing mm -hmm. that accompanies that and that's what separates mm -hmm. you know god anointed jesus of nazareth with the holy ghost and with power who went about doing good and so there's always fruit from anointing mm -hmm. so you can find musicians even in the church who are not anointed, and because of that, there is no fruit. There is nothing that uh, that helps people understand God or helps people worship God mm -hmm. if there's no anointing. And this is just mm -hmm. something that the Holy Spirit does. And I believe mm -hmm. um, the anointing increases through intimacy with God. So, mm -hmm. absolutely, I've taught many seminars on this to musicians, Fantastic. and it doesn't matter how good you are as a musician, you still have to be anointed. Mm -hmm. Again. Um, uh, and another proof of this, uh, Dudley, is if you look uh, when David set up the tabernacle, the famous tabernacle of David, which not a lot of people actually know about, but it's it's been promised that God is going to restore the tabernacle in Acts 15, verse 16. He says the tabernacle which has fallen down. So the tabernacle of David is is it's a reference basically to the end time church that the church is going to be restored to its fullness. Mm -hmm. Now that restoration has been taking place for 2000 years, mm -hmm. but it will reach a climax. It will reach a peace, a, a peak before Jesus comes back. Mm -hmm. So he's talking about uh, interesting terminology. He's talking about the restoration of the tabernacle, tabernacle, which has fallen down. And, and so it almost is like, um, God is going to resurrect a church that is in a fallen down state. And I believe when we look at the church today, the church is not in any way glorious. We're doing our best and there's some good things happening. We thank God for that. But I don't believe it's reached its fullness, its full capacity, as it were, its glorious state that I believe we will see before Jesus comes back. But yeah. the point I was going to make here okay. was this, is when David set up the tabernacle, um, there was 4,000 musicians, but the chief musicians, there was four major musicians. There's a guy called Kananiah, Asaph, Heman, and Jejuthun. Now, the interesting thing about this is that, that all of those guys were, three of them were called prophets. So when he set up the music ministry, he actually had um, men who were incredibly uh, skillful because the Bible talks about them being skillful. But there were also prophets, so there were spiritual men as well. Mm -hmm. So you get that combination is, is found in Scripture, and that combination still has to work in the local church, especially mm -hmm. as we get closer to the end of the age. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we're going to have to see a, a, an anointing yeah. that breaks yeah. forth from musicians who are actually anointed by God to release 
the gifts of the Holy Spirit and everything else that's going to happen. Evangelism, massive evangelism is going to take place. Yeah, nice. um, yeah. I believe all of that will happen in the local church. OK, well, we only have a few minutes left, Tom. So I'm going to ask you quickly to, to tell us just in, in a nutshell, what is the Psalmody course? Well, the Psalmody is a ministry that God gave me um, to help people develop a lifestyle of worship. So it's the lifestyle. It's not a musical course. It is a course that that uh, that helps people, and it's on uh, it's on our website samity.org, and I encourage people to go to that. We've got different courses there, but it's on video. Um, we've just recorded new video. Uh, all the lessons and the courses are on video. There's uh, there's notes that go along with that, and it really is to help people develop worship as a lifestyle because that's really what worship is. It is it is much more than a musical warm-up that we do before somebody preaches. Mm -hmm. But it really is a lifestyle that has to be developed. And the only way to do that is the principles that are found in God's Word. And so we take those principles, and week by week, we show the people through the course how to develop that. And uh, and by the way, there's a weekly newsletter that is free where I'm, I'm, I'm speaking about worship principles. Every week, if you go to samedy.org, you can sign up for that free um, newsletter. Psalmody.org. Thank you for that. Org, uh, yeah. Tom, incredible, living out a lifestyle of worship and praise. Um, somebody once said, God is looking for more than just Sunday morning kisses. <laughs> it's a, a lifestyle, That's it's a daily living it out. Uh, does that mean that I should be yeah. you know, singing every minute of the day with my hands raised? No. How do I live out that lifestyle? Mm -hmm. Just in, in two minutes, tell me, how can I live out that lifestyle? Well, the only way to do it, and, and it's a fallacy if we try any other way. Um, first of all, there, there's certain principles. I'll go through this quickly. There's certain principles that are related to this, the subjects of thanksgiving, praise, and worship. Um, and these are the foundational things that we teach. Number one is thanksgiving is always associated in Scripture with the presence of God. So where there is presence, there is a response to that presence, and it's called thanksgiving. So we teach people how to develop a lifestyle of thanksgiving based on their salvation, which is the presence of God. So if we cannot be more thankful about our salvation, it's probably going to be difficult to thank God for anything else. So you, that is where we prioritize thanksgiving. Praise is based on God's word. It is impossible to praise God without knowledge. We cannot praise a God that we don't know. So we show people how to get into the principles of God's word and, and develop praise through the word. And then the last one is worship. And worship is, is really not slow songs. That is an expression of worship. But true biblical worship that God is seeking is worship that is based on obedience to God. And I put it like this, that um, worship is not the last slow song you sung, but the last thing that you did that God asked you to do or told you mm -hmm. to do. So worship is really more than anything else all about obedience. And so we teach those basic foundational principles, those three. Mm -hmm. And then from that, everything else emanates from that. Mm -hmm. Warfare, evangelism, peace, everything else really comes from those foundations. Fantastic. Amazing stuff. Well, Tom, it's been really amazing speaking to you today. I'd love to have been able to speak to you more about um, some of the aspects that Jesus taught us. He said, um, the time is coming where we won't worship God on a mountain or in a temple, or dare I say in a cathedral or a chapel, yep. but we worship him in spirit and in truth. I believe that the true place of worship is right here in my heart. If we want to find a place of worship, I have to get before God on my knees uh, and live it out, as you rightly said. Tom, thank you so much for sharing with us today on The Reality Show. We pray God's blessing. There's so much more we could talk about, but we pray God's blessing and that anointing uh, will continue as you pastor a church. Just to, for the record, Tom also pastors a church in Sydney, Australia. Uh, we're talking to him today in Australia. Thank you so much for joining us on The Reality Show. Thank you, Dudley. It's a great privilege to be on your show. And uh, I'm, well, I'm so grateful. So thank you and to all your uh, audience, your listeners, your viewers. Uh, it's great being with you. Thanks for the opportunity. God bless you. Well, for the last half hour or so, we've been talking to Tom Ingalls, finding out a little bit about this aspect of living out our worship before God, uh, because God wants us to, to enter into relationship with Him. If I'm in relationship with my wife, I will talk to her, I will enjoy her company. We can be silent in each other's company and yet still enjoy each other's company. And God, as we said earlier, is not just seeking worship. 
is not seeking just music unto him. In fact, music is not worship and worship is not music. Music is just a vehicle, a tool to worship God. God is seeking the worshiper. He's seeking your heart, he's seeking my heart to come before him, to kneel before him when we can, to raise our hands when we can, to sing out loud and clear, to sing out quietly as we worship him in spirit and in truth, but also to live it out every single day of our lives. As Tom said, starting with thanksgiving, and we thank God for the salvation plan of God. We began our discussion with Tom today talking about his salvation and how he came to know Jesus as Lord and Savior. Could be that you're watching, watching up today and you think, oh, that's all very good and very well for a famous singer, you know, coming to know Jesus. But Jesus died not just for famous singers. He didn't just die for television presenters. He died for the world. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And if you're part of the world, I dare say you are, then he died for you. So I leave this with you today as we've been sharing the story uh, of uh, a life touched and changed for the good uh, by the grace and the, and the reality of Jesus. I leave this with you. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Have you come to a place in your life where you've said, okay, Lord, I got it wrong. You know how difficult it is, especially in our day and age to admit it, we got it wrong, to admit our faults. Well, to do that and say, God, I got it wrong. Today, I want to put my faith in you, and I pray that you will work it out in my life. I want to live a lifestyle of worship and praise before you. If you'd like to know more about that, I invite you to drop me a note by email, if you will, to my personal email address. You can write to me, dudley at surereality.net. Well, thank you so much for your company today. Look forward to hearing from you. Until next time, keep your eyes on Jesus. God bless, and keep walking in the reality of Jesus.